Hello everyone. I am Tanya. I came to you from Odessa. I work for a product IT company called Rido. For more than six years, I was engaged in localization of mobile apps that our company is doing. I will not reinvent the wheel for you, but tell you something you've never heard, especially provided the speeches that we've heard before mine. However, today I will demonstrate your real-life examples of how localization works in our company as well, where we started, where we came to, where we are now. I'll share our success stories and our epic fails that we also had. So I do hope you will be interested or at least not bored. A couple of words about the company. Rigdal started 2014 years ago. We started developing our own apps for iPhone, which was not very well known then. We have more than 30 different applications, games, a mobile browser, readers of various sorts. Not all of them stood the test of time. Some we had to take away from App Store, some we resold to other startups. Ultimately, now the company has a portfolio of four applications that are stably developing. They are all available from App Store for iPhone, iPad, some can be used as Macs and Google Play. I'd like to say that our applications are popular. I'll take this moment for boasting a little bit. We regularly make it to the top of Google Play and App Store, and this is just a small portion where we were seen. The press, the media, they write about us locally, internationally, and we are grateful for that. The largest achievement, I believe, is that we could win the hearts of 130 million of people worldwide. Localization has very much to do with this figure. The localization of our applications started from iOS 4. A month from now, iOS 15 will be released. The first application was very small, primitive, take a note. iPhone users could make notes using their phones. It was released in 2010. And the first locale, apart from the original English one, was the German. This is how the German application looked. Quite simple, 2010, well, that was the time. The situation now is different with the locales that we support. Their number increased largely. Everything that our company does now, starting from applications and then going on to marketing materials, email shorts, landings, all of that is interpreted from the original English to 10 plus locales Russian, Portuguese, Ukrainian, Japanese, Spanish, German, Italian and Vietnamese. This set of languages didn't happen like that from the very beginning. Languages were added one by one. Yet the choice of languages was motivated by two factors, the demand that we saw for our apps in various countries and the ability to pay for them. During the time that I was doing localization, I came up to the conclusion that this is a complex process. It needs to be planned. It has the beginning, but it has no end. And it follows its own rules. If you follow the rules, you can adapt any product, any service to any country you wish. And today, I will invite you to go through the primary 10 steps you need 
to make sure your app is successful somewhere far away. So, the first stage is the simplest. You need to find the answer to the question like this. What are the languages that we need to interpret our product to? Here we use analytics, either App Store Connect Analytics or Google Analytics. I know there is a large number of other instruments which can be more complicated and they give you more understanding about your audience. But the basic is this. It's enough to understand how many people download your product daily, what the churn rate is, and so on. This is a Vietnamese locale, and I'll exemplify this, how one, we use the analytics to add another language. One of our apps was free documents, was free, and it had a set of languages, but there was no Vietnamese there, because we believe this is no market for us. But once we looked into App Store analytics, and we saw that Vietnamese Vietnam makes it to the top 15 download countries, 200,000 users a month. Of course, we were happy, but the problem was that out of these 200,000 users, more than 70 percent stopped using the application in a week and never came back. We started analyzing what it was they didn't like. And what was on the surface, of course, was the language. So we decided that we would interpret it into Vietnamese. So we translated it all and the product page in the App Store into Vietnamese. And in a week, We saw that the retention rate grew by 20%. Another week, more growth. And the Vietnamese market was definitely worth it. We still see this. So the conclusion number one is this. Look for your markets, analyze data. Maybe Vietnam, in your case, is no target for you, but in our case, it did work. So do look into the analytical data, maybe more often and earlier. Step two, that's the team. Once you know the language you will translate into, you need to understand who is going to do that. The situation with our team of translators is unique. We do not have translators in our staff sitting in the office. At the same time, we do not use translation interpretation bureaus or agencies. It historically happened so that most of our apps are translated by our big fans. It's a group of people, that's our team. So it's a group of people, 18 people, not all of them are here. These are our loyal users scattered around the world from China to Brazil. These are people who have been translating all of our products for many years, eight years more. What does it give us? Since these are the same people, they know very well the product they are translating. They know the history of the company. They're engaged in the process. They're always in touch. It could be night time or we could be really very late, running late in terms of deadlines. We try to keep friendly relationship with them and stay in touch despite the differences. And these are examples of how our translators came to meet us several years ago. Colleagues from Germany came and on the right, that's me, the visit to Berlin. Again, this is our translator in Germany meeting me in his office. So, conclusion, look for your ambassadors, build your team, a team of translators who will be always on touch. This is your human potential, the golden reserve, as we heard in the previous speech. Yes,
No instruments, the tools that we're going to use. We know the language, we have the team. Now we need tools that we will use for translation. My toolbox has three tools I use every day. First of all, that's WhatsApp. Why and how does it come in here handy? Well, we need it for chit chat with our translators. We have a group in WhatsApp. We are all here in one chat and we can talk on various topics, new releases, birthday congratulations, other tasks related to work or something else, including smileys and hearts. It's all here. What it gives us, not only we as managers talk to the translators here, but the translators themselves can communicate and they get closer, which improves the team spirit. Our second tool, it's ClickUp. It's a task management tool we started using some six months ago. It has a lot of things to give. We are not using all of them right now. Some things we do use, though, and this is how we distribute the assigns, assignments to the translators. We follow deadlines. We add comments. We see how the progress goes for each particular task. And the first, the third is crowding. All of our translators is here. This is a translation management tool. Everything we did in 10 years, it's all here. I will not talk much about it, just enough to say that we have been particularly happy over all of these 10 years. And we support at our local producers, people from Ternopil. The support team is really great. Next step. It keeps jumping ahead of me. Garbage in, garbage out. I thought I would not try to look for a Russian equivalent. It's the best way you can put it in. What I mean here is this. You have your team, you have your tools, you're ready to fly. Don't do it. Don't hurry up, because really we learned a lot here and we learned it hard. Before you really start localization, you need to make sure that your incoming text, English or any other language, are good. Stylistics, punctuation, grammar and even common sense, it's all there. In our company, we usually proofread all of our texts with native speakers. Sometimes we can do it by ourselves, sometimes not. Well, things can happen, something can leak in, sometimes typo get in, I'll show you some examples. But what's worse, if it is bullshit in terms of the uh, information, bullshit input makes bullshit output. Please follow your content. Your responsible for clarity, at least at that point of entry. This is an example for you. I hope you see it well. These are screenshots from our apps, an interface online. Select none, you can see it on the top, but at least it's not user-friendly. It should be something like this select us which means, again, bad proofreading. Here you find a typo in scholar, H is missing. Here the prices are different, 49.99 and then 78.99, and you don't really know who did it, but that happens. Here the meaning is not really quite the what we wanted, edit, and then the same button is called add outline, probably something changed in the product and was not reflected into the English version of the text. Another typo authorized, this is a very fresh screenshot, quite recent one. Uh, the next step uh, is uh, actually localization of the interface. Uh, that's the core. 
as uh, I said, all our uh, translations are made in uh, Crowdin, but uh, our developers are also made uh, automation uh, tools uh, and uh, scripts that can actually uh, drag in all our uh, translations uh, and then upload uh, into the uh, strings. And uh, to sh uh, I cannot show that uh, because uh, I didn't have time to speak to the developers and uh, get the information from them. But that's uh, actually I told you how we work. Sasha also uh, showed slag of uh, notifications. We also have this uh, feature with crowding, and there are, if there are any crowding changes or we are tagged, then we can see in our slack uh, right away uh, that something had happened and we need to go there and see what's happening. Now I'm showing some uh, screens uh, how localized uh, apps uh, look like uh, Japanese, Russian. Uh, these are a Spark printer. More examples. Uh, besides uh, the app, uh, it, uh, apps themselves, uh, we uh, also translate uh, the guides. Uh, this is the example how uh, the guide looks like in Spanish, Japanese, Russian. They do not uh, look uh, very differently, only the text is different. Uh, besides the app itself, uh, there's uh, also creative content uh, um, uh, around it, uh, and localization has to consider that as well. I'm going to show that uh, during uh, discounts, uh, for example, uh, Black Friday, uh, we have a banner uh, uh, advertising. Uh, we also translate that. Uh, that's uh, how we, you can see uh, on different languages uh, how the discount uh, tabs look like. And uh, that's uh, another uh, paywall. Uh, that's splash screen uh, made uh, several years ago for uh, Black Friday period. And uh, I would like to bring your attention uh, that how 60% discount uh, was uh, actually translated differently to different languages. For example, you can see that uh, in uh, Chinese, you do not have 60%. You have just uh, four. And that means that only the native speaker can actually uh, show how the discounts are translated uh, in that very languages. So here you have the share uh, that you have to uh, pay, uh, taking into account the uh, discount. Uh, in uh, German and French, you can see that uh, uh, in French the euro sign is after uh, the figure uh, with a space, and uh, in German uh, it's before uh, the f figure itself. Uh, uh, these are tiny things, but but it's all about uh, trust to the uh, product, to the company. Uh, another example of uh, translated discounts. I don't look at, at the uh, prices because the screens were made uh, from uh, testing devices. And they are also uh, translated differently uh, for 50%. Uh, depending on the language. The next uh, stage, uh, localization of letters and uh, websites, that's our creative content. That's uh, an example how a letter, uh, newsletter, looked like with uh, iOS uh, 13 um, uh, release. And uh, visually, it's uh, very similar, but uh, the text is different. Uh, that's, uh, that is an outdated uh, Black Friday uh, one. Uh, here is an example of uh, uh, landing uh, of uh, uh, simplified Chinese. And uh, you can uh, also see that, uh, uh, sure, uh, it, it was uh, for Chinese, uh, another one for the German. Here we also have uh, Japanese, and we have the background uh, of an Asian woman on the background. We want to uh, uh, culturally uh, blend in. 
If uh, you did the translation of an app, the uh, work hasn't finished. If you want to get more attention from your audience, you need to prepare a uh, page uh, in App Store, uh, Huawei Gallery, and uh, there could be different stores, uh, no matter which. Usually, uh, we invite uh, uh, our specialists uh, on App Store so that they analyze uh, the market, look at our competitors, uh, uh, learn semantics, uh, make the keywords uh, description uh, in the best way so as to bring uh, us uh, higher uh, in the search results. Uh, this is an example uh, of uh, how to culturally adapt uh, one of our uh, apps uh, to the uh, Chinese market. PDF expert uh, in uh, all languages uh, is the same, but uh, in Chinese it's different. Uh, the App uh, in English uh, is in brackets, but uh, actually the name of uh, uh, this uh, is different. We we have uh, hieroglyphics, and we asked uh, for help uh, from our uh, translator in Chinese. We uh, asked to uh, uh, research the market and uh, to help uh, with uh, this. Uh, work. He did a good job, and he actually gave us an interesting uh, story. Uh, we uh, actually see that uh, the icon of a PDF expert looks like an eye. Uh, in Chinese, uh, there is a phrase, uh, the idiom that uh, to uh, perfect something, to make something uh, better, and uh, there we have the eye, like uh, to finish uh, drawing with an eye. Uh, historically, this idiom uh, came from a uh, uh, legend. Uh, there was a very good uh, artist uh, in China. Uh, he uh, actually uh, would paint uh, and draw different uh, nice uh, pictures, like dragons, and but he never uh, drew uh, eyes. Uh, the people, the passerbys, uh, asked uh, him, why don't you finish with the eyes? Uh, he says that uh, if I do, uh, the dragons will fly away. Uh, they asked him so much, and uh, then uh, this uh, very dragon uh, flew away. And uh, since then, in uh, Chinese, this idiom is used uh, to uh, finish with eyes means uh, actually to uh, make a perfection, make uh, I, an ideal out of something. And uh, it made uh, pretty uh, good with uh, this uh, Chinese icon, like a PDF, uh, to make something better out of something. And uh, to our surprise, uh, six months later, our application uh, broke all the records and uh, it was higher than Adobe Acrobat. Uh, people started to look for uh, this very app for, uh, by uh, this uh, very uh, uh, how uh, it is called and it is still in App Store. That's our success story. And this is an example of uh, visual artworks in App Store. Besides localization of uh, the name of uh, the uh, app uh, description, we also uh, put a lot of efforts uh, to adapt to the market uh, le level. For example, here we have uh, for uh, the press, the media, uh, that uh, actually spoke or wrote about us in uh, respective countries. And we think that uh, by doing so, uh, the uh, token of uh, trust in Japan or Germany uh, has risen. Uh, this is an example uh, how email providers 
are different from country to country. For example, in uh, Japan, we have Yahoo Japan. We support uh, this, uh, and uh, it is uh, there, actually. And uh, in Germany, for example, we also have the second row is different from other countries as well. Uh, this, uh, these are uh, very fresh ones, uh, and uh, they were made uh, this year. Uh, we uh, also wanted to please our Japanese uh, uh, customers uh, in Japan, uh, and uh, we updated uh, this, uh, ma making it more bright. Uh, a, a fox is very popular and brings a positive connotation uh, for Japan, uh, and that's another example example how we did it uh, for the Chinese market. Uh, this year the symbol is uh, the uh, golden calf and uh, according to it we uh, changed uh, these uh, artworks. Uh, here you can see four but uh, there, uh, there are ten of them. Uh, we do not have enough space for the uh, to show it better. In English speaking uh, countries we also have Google Meet from the supported services and uh, since uh, uh, a big uh, Chinese firewall uh, does not support it, we do not show it to uh, China. If we think that uh, these uh, sophisticated uh, features are actually uh, of uh, direct effect uh, and uh, we can uh, say for sure that yes, it works, uh, I cannot say that. Uh, we do it actually to attract uh, the uh, customers, uh, to engage them, uh, to show respect to their culture. And uh, probably it has an impact uh, for retention uh, on the product. Next uh, ninth uh, step. Uh, as soon as we uh, translated uh, our app uh, and everything is uh, ready in App Store and we are ready to release it, to launch it, uh, don't uh, hurry up, uh, test everything. Uh, I'm not speaking about the text uh, team, I'm speaking about testing by translators. Usually when the translation is uh, done, we upload uh, that uh, uh, for the um, better version in test flight. Uh, that's uh, what App Store uh, actually gives uh, to us. Uh, then we give uh, this reference to our uh, translators. Uh, since our uh, base uh, of uh, translators is quite big, and uh, then translators uh, tra test uh, everything, uh, probably they do not spot everything. But uh, if they do, they can actually put uh, into crowd in. Uh, and uh, I would say that uh, on this very stage, 40% uh, of something uh, is uh, just uh, written over because uh, it doesn't look good. Uh, since we have uh, a, an opportunity to make it better, uh, we do so. And uh, my uh, tenth uh, most favorite uh, step, and these are fuck ups, uh, despite the fact that uh, we are that good, we do everything well, uh, we still have uh, fuck ups. Uh, I uh, can uh, divide them uh, by three uh, reasons. The first one is uh, not enough space. We always uh, lack uh, space. Uh, very often the product uh, companies uh, do not have uh, enough uh, uh, place uh, for uh, other languages. For example, German it could be 30% uh, longer than English. That's why we might have some big problems and unfortunately uh, people uh, can see that. Uh, you will see uh, on the screen that uh, uh, something was uh, uh, redone on uh, that stage. Uh, here uh, you, you can see the text was uh, actually on uh, the button. Uh, there was not enough space and uh, the same refers to French. Uh, here we have uh, the Ukrainian uh, uh, language problem, something is bad with uh, uh, Russian, Here, there we have uh, another Ukrainian uh, problem. 
And that's uh, also a long uh, problem. We uh, uh, didn't uh, have an opportunity to fix it. Uh, Portuguese uh, people did uh, had uh, zero percent of discount, and uh, here we have uh, Russian as uh, always. Uh, Second reason for all of our fuck-ups is not enough context. Very often our translators are blindfolded, meaning that either the developers do not provide us at least a text version of the context, meaning where that line will go. Is it the name of a folder? Is it the name of a button? Is it a verb? And we always have to come back and ask, see the design uh, and feed me or in any other tool available. And of course, due to the lack of context, we suffer a lot. That's an example. Thumbnail view. In Russian, this is a page in a miniature. Was interpreted here is a checked page or a grid. Probably the translator did not understand the context, but that was really serious fuck up. We know here. Uh, it's a page where you could choose your font, and the weight was interpreted as a physical weight, which is a different parameter, not thickness. I give you Russian examples, not because our Russian translators are really well, bad, but it's just to make the examples meaningful to you. We would not understand Japanese, would we? Here, the form of the word is wrong, to the left, to the right, on the left, on the right. Um, though it had to be something like turn left, turn right. Here, where that was the word in English was interpreted just as is where, but a different meaning in Russian. We really saw that several years after this localization went to App Store. Here, that's my favorite, two buttons, two buttons, basically, one says decline, the other says the same, but in a different form of the word. So you can choose either and you will always be right. The third reason, no time. We never have time. All of the translators are necessary yesterday. and. Uh, the time of releases or updates, we are always rushed. It's natural. And this is how we usually look. Like this poor dog on the front line somewhere. But of course, since there is no time, we make mistakes. Most of them are related to meaning. There is no time to think. So mail short was telling our users that our app can be found at all device can be working on all devices, iPhone, iPad, and we gave it a name as a cycle of files in nature. I end uh, cloud, cloud storage, we call this gigabyte venues. So people were very creative here, really they were. Another example, we were advertising our new function. You can fast forward video content, double clicking from the left to the right, 10 seconds of, uh, of the st at a time, but then it has to be really a long video to do that. These are typos. Uh, very often this is something we miss because you don't really have a clear view already. It's a mistake in terms of the final letter. Uh, it had to be a different case. Again, a typo, a word that is misspelled and gives it a funny sound. But we fixed it. I can tell you we did. So thank you, but I will actually 
have something else to tell you. Localization is a complex process. There are no ideal. We are all just learning how to do that perfectly. And I do hope that we all remember that language is a living entity. It keeps changing. And our task as that of localizers is to observe the change and reflect it in our translations. If you are a user, if you use our product, maybe you saw some of the icons from the previous slides. So, if you use something, if you didn't like something about translation, maybe Spanish, Japanese, French, Russian, Ukrainian, please email me. I'll be happy to hear from you. And if you have questions right now, I'll be happy to address them as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I have a question. In your company, testing, linguistic, functional testing, how is that organized? Who does it? Some independent people or translators who do translation? And what kind of platform do you use for that? So do you check the screenshots or do you use a simulator? What do you do? Thank you for such a good question. This is what we do. We're actually quite good at testing, but we're using a fairly old model because I heard from other people today. And uh, I thought that probably we need to that, do that too. We have a testing team like any product company, but it's not really language quality assurance team. This team tests the application, its logic, and also checks localization provided they have time. So before releases, when we understand that they have too much on their hands, we have a lot of applications. Releases happen regularly every several weeks for different products. So we assume this kind of responsibility, me as a manager and our translators, we now do check our own translations. We use simulators to check translation. This does our quality assurance team, but they have some other devices, simulators as well. Translators have a link to better version. They download it to their devices, and then they take a look, see what they have time to monitor. Of course, they don't go into all of the fine tuning, but what they can they do? And uh, as managers, we also do that. We use test devices or our devices to see what's happening. I think that still can be organized in a different way, more professionally, to avoid these failures that sometimes happen. But generally, this is what we do in terms of testing. Thank you. Um, I'm a loyal customer for many years using iPhone, using Mac. I document and reader. So thank you very much. You saved many, many hours for me. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. That was really very interesting. I have a question about translators because this is a very interesting approach. You don't use anybody in between you in the translators. You said these were your largest fans. How do you get in touch or do they get in touch with you? How do you select them? How do you try and test them? Because what you told us about the Chinese language, it's not just a translator that was a very advanced person in terms of localization. How do you evaluate that? From resumes or what? Thank you for this, this question. 
actually I meant to say that, but I forgot how we select our translators. All of them who we have now, they all came to us through our support team. We pay lots of time and effort on our support teams, 40 to 50 people who write uh, their answers, so this is not a phone support team, they write answers. Some people wrote to our support team eight years ago, ten years ago, that we love your product and we want to help you translate the apps that we love so much into our languages. So such tickets that our support team receives, collects, and we put them into a special file and we know that for example, now we are not going to translate into the Czech language. We still save such contacts because should we desire to have advertising on Facebook and the Czech Republic, then this kind of file reserve will help us find the kinds of people we need. The people who work with us, with us of course, we looked at their resume, but Actually, you can see it, what the user writes in the tickets to the support team. They usually write a lot about their experience, where they worked. We filter it all in. We trust them with many things. I can't say that we really do a thorough investigation. We got lucky that these people are not just our big fans, but they are also linguists in terms of calling, in terms of translation. Our Spanish translator has a bureau for translation. The person in Portugal works for Adobe Acrobat. Uh, it's a competitor, but he loves us as well, and he's been with us for a number of years. So does it answer your question? I, I hope so. But this is how we really collect those little stars of ours and try to get in touch. Not all companies do that. Yeah. Yes, I will say that you said thank you to those people. They are really, really good. Thank you, Tatiana. That's a great approach. Do we have more questions? Going back to looking for mistakes and glitches, are your translators the people who check them or support checks for them or do you have some kind of a back tracker? Thank you. Well, it's 50-50. Something is tracked by our translators. Some, unfortunately, does go away to App Store, to Google Play, and then either users will write to our support team, which will inform us immediately, and we will do something, which is a lengthy process, because users need to think about what they want to write. Then we have Twitter, and that works fast. If somebody sees something that's wrong, our Twitter community is really very active, because they will tag us immediately, we never had a huge problem with them, of course, but Twitter is a good way of learning, of hearing feedback about our translation. We don't really have a tracker where users can inform us about a bug, and then we have a way of thanking them. We only have that for security done by our tech developers, so in case there are some kind of soft spots, but that usually the web part. If something's wrong there, then we even pay for that. People will report such problems, such bugs, and we will fix them and reward them for that. Twitter, what else did I mean to say? Well, that seems to be it. At least, well, I might have forgotten. Well, this is how it happens anyway. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, we will let you go. Uh, that was awesome, a very good uh, presentation, so interesting uh, how everything was organized.